Hello everyone, my name is Blitz here, and we have returned back to the letter. You really must look where you're going if you insist on running about. Do you tell where is the fire? Hmm. Fire of this cause, or maybe? Well, in that case, we're just going to look through here and see what we can find of all this. Okay, alone, Luke heard voices coming from a nearby ballroom. When he decided to investigate, he was insulted by memories not of his own. Excuse me. And at the centre of it all, the same woman who appeared before him the day before. Quite. Hmm. Oh, thank God you're here. I do hope you don't have a concussion. Can you count backwards from 15 to 1 for me? Oh, blank. <laughs> Just help me up. I do not think it's sold to me if you do have a concussion as a smart decision, but no, really, 15 to 1. That woman, she was here. I told you to keep an eye out for her. The other man offers an arm and pulls me up to my feet there. But before I can storm off and pull, it back, pull him to the ballroom, he anchors me down with one hand on my shoulder and the other touching the back of my head. No bruise, no bump. But it still does not mean you don't have a concussion. If you are too late to count backwards, can you tell me your full name? Where are you currently? We don't have uh Luke City Mitchell Wright. And this is Amagrade's bloody foyer. But we don't have time for that. We must make and do have the time to make sure you are not broken in the head. I have already sent the security to scour the whole house when I saw you running out of the parlour. Dumb cough. If the woman is here, they will have her. You will only be slowing them down if you plan to interfere. When he points us out, I realise that there are guards starting to falter into the house as we speak, with some already searching the nearby rooms, armed and uniformed men going about in pairs, making it so that the house is in a flurry of activity. He lets me go then, with the knowledge that I'm not going to kneel over any time soon. I was wishing you were, you were tired from dealing with the young miss on my return. Instead, you come running and hit your head. Such a troublesome boy. Shall I be carrying you to bed too? I can manage just fine on my own though. I don't see how I could sleep until that woman is caught. It'll be easier to keep you safe in your quarters. This is twice we've known the woman to break in. I think we could just safely presume that you hold her interest. He says it as a matter of fact in a tone that broke no argument. Not like I'll argue if it means I'm kept safe. The two of us hurry upstairs, though we remain watchful and weary of any potential threats to my person. We'll make it to the master bedroom without any trouble though, and two of the security are left outside the door. No problems at all. Not until we get inside. Johan's eyes scan the room wildly, a look of dread on his unusual stotic face. Now, I don't understand for a moment, looking around the bedroom, it's empty. But then I realised, where's Hannah? She came home with you from the hospital, didn't she? She's supposed to be here. I sent one of my mates to accompany her here to let her rest. Hmm. <clears throat> I feel the colour drain from my face when he raises a hand to stop me from charging out there. Stay. I am not staying here while Hannah stays out there. One of the guards will find her and bring her here. And what if they don't? What if that woman gets to her first? What if she already has her? That's not possible. You can't promise that. Mm. There's no second thought as I reach under the side of my bed and pull out one of my knives. I have no doubt that the other man can take me on if we're both in arms. But with this, I can even take the field. I can even the field. Okay, or at least deter him from escalating the situation and risking hurting either of us. I'm going out there to look for Hannah. And you're either with me or you aren't. I'm not risking Hannah, and I'm not leaving her alone. Still like a stubborn mule, he refuses to budge from the door. There's a withering look on him and as, as I try to match. One that somehow I'm losing fast to. Even with him not saying a word yet. Can you see yourself in the mirror right now? You are in no proper state to look, go looking for anyone. If this will make you happy, I will do the looking. But please, and don't make me repeat this, stay where it's safe, where security can watch you. We already have one person to be worried about. Please don't add another one to the list. Perhaps it is his turn, in spite of his general disdain of virtually everything that has to do with me. 
I like to think that over the years he has grown to care for her though, at least. As much as I loathe to admit this, I trust him with her safety over any servant in this house. So, and a quiz, you have two hours. I don't think I don't think it'll take that long to find one missing woman in this house. Hmm. <clears throat> Two hours, and any more than that, and I am going out there, of course. Hmm. Despite his words, he lingers. If I didn't know any better, I'd say he wants to make sure I get him back down bed and sleep until before he turns away from me. What am I, a child? What do you mean treating me like one? There's a reason why we will never get along. Well, what are you waiting for? And the knife? The knife stays very well. Only then does he seem to get the hint. With a nod, he leaves, locks the door, and closes the door behind him. For a moment, I still hear his voice while he gives the guards outside firm instructions. Then a hush as soon as he, as, as soon as he departs and his footsteps fade away. One that doesn't quite last. As quickly as the silence settles, lightning flashes across the sky, followed immediately by the loud boom of thunder. And that blank strikes so dangerously close that I can feel the electricity in the air. The power goes out not a second later, and I feel like I'm as if I'm being mocked by whatever greater power there is. All is deathly still for a moment, but soon the rain starts once again, far heavier than the light drizzle from this morning. It's pitter patter hitting hard against this place's world. Rod. Rude? Yeah, it must be rude. Once again, we are at stakes here. Oh yeah, that was it. Bumping into Luke after his flight from the ballroom, Joe Harsh quickly ushered the paranoid man to his room, while the house's security looked for the trespasser, only to be greeted by a room devoid of Hannah, who was supposed to have arrived with the butler. My. I'm safe here. Hannah will be safe too. Joe Harsh will find her, and when I wake, she'll be here. It does not take long. Once my head hits the pillow in a matter of minutes, the darkness claims to me, bringing with it laughter and whispers of a twisted love from a time long gone. Who are you? S stay away. Sweet dreams, my love. It'll be over soon. <laughs> November the first Tuesday. Yet in spite of the unfamiliar voices and unwanted touches from shadows lurking in the dark, Rousing is a slow, arduous process. Difficult, every limb heavy with lead, no matter my aversion for the words that murmur in my ears or the sight of her horrid smile from afar. My body refused to yield. I am at their mercy, beyond fathomable reason. My consciousness refuses the pull of the waking world, choosing to linger in the pit of dreams. Pits of a dream, gradually drawing me deeper into unknown depths. Somehow, even if it might mean I may never open my eyes, I allow them. You do not belong there, my prince. Not that I mind getting it an extra few hours, of course. The bed's more comfortable as it is, after an exhausting day yesterday. Babysitting Kylie and the stress of finding an intruder in my own home. <coughs> Excuse me. I think I deserve a little break. Every once in a while, especially after going through all that in a single day. I can only be on the receiving end of so many unacceptable things within the span of a few hours, you know. As gracious a host and person as I am, my patience has its limits too. Although there's still the problem with Hannah, I haven't forgotten that of course, but that's why I hired Joe Hans. He's competent enough. He won't even last a day in my service if he's any less than those half-wits who think they can deceive me with sweet words. He's more than capable of working on his own without guidance. Let the butler take care of that little problem with Hannah while I... Hannah? You do not need her. I am here. We are here. This is where your home is. Where you belong for the blood we share. Come back to us. How long has it been since... Joe Hans has never taken this long before. Surely there should have been an update by now, right? So why is in there? No. No. Please. Please don't go. Bloody hell the cretins I've surrounded myself with. And isn't that enough to force myself out of bed? As it has always been the case. 
though. No. My eyes fly open, expecting the warm rays of sunshine filtering through the curtains, only to be greeted by a blinding flash of light and a loud boom of thunder that sounded near too close to my ears. Strong gusts of wind will occasionally burst in from the open balcony door, bringing in drizzles of cold rain into the room. I must have left it open earlier before dozing off. The carpet in the floor closest to it is already drenched. Hannah's going to be so cross when she sees this. Not that it's an immediate problem. If anything, it's with this power outage, we should be in mind in first. With the intruder still at large, steering through with its darkness might be far more fatal than multiple stab wounds or gunshots with chest. Great. The power stood out. This is exactly what I need right now, yes? It's this storm, of course. I should have moved back to the penthouse to weather it in a much more comfortable setting. Already I can hear the creak and groans of his old place as rain beats against the window. Joe Hans, has someone been sent to check the circuit breaker? Yes. No answer. Joe Hans, silence. Joe Hans, someone, anyone. Still nothing, and my cordial mood is quickly dis dissipating. Where are these idiots when you need them? It's really a wonder why he hasn't fixed this yet. Was I really out that long? Can't be. It's only been a few hours after midnight. If the time on my wristwatch is anything to go by, unless I forgot to change it again after that last overseas trip a month ago. Though the delay is understandable, if he went looking for Hannah as he promised, but bloody hell my safety's also at stake here. Cursing. I stay still, letting my eyes try and adjust to the darkness while my hands fumble for my slippers. If that butler isn't going to fix this, I may as well order up a security post outside to do it. It's probably just a blown blown fuse. Anyone with a brain can repair one. Grabbing my jacket and my footwear finally on, I make for the door. Although in haste, I briefly pause when a gleam catches my eye on one of my drawers underneath a clutter I've yet to organise. The muzzle of a gun peaks. Hannah has never openly commented at my possession of it, but I know she does not approve of it. Name a bloody firearms policy in this nation. Of course, I've not much fond use of it in the seven years we've been together, otherwise she would have already have thrown it away years ago. Doesn't it mean doesn't mean it won't be useful right now. Without second thought, I seize it, sending the stuff piled above it onto the floor. Ugh Whatever. I'll get to it later. This blackout problem should be resolved first. Right next to my missing security details, it turns out. Where the blank did everyone go? There were two, weren't there? Um, Joe Hans had two blokes posted to stand guard for the night. I might be panicking for a bit earlier, but I'm quite sure I haven't got, got in dis delusional yet. What? Did both of them decide to take a break? Because they think the master's already sound asleep and won't be looking for them? Damn nitwits. I know assassinations happen very rarely these days, and even less in a peaceful city like Luxburn, but bloody hell. There's been a woman going in and out of this place uninvited who may or may not want to put a knife in my back. Is there enough reason to stay on alert? I'm fairly certain Joe Hans won't just enlist their help just for this power outage, only to leave me unprotected. We have a difficult friendship to speak, but I doubt that man is an opportunist. I'm holding the lives of his family in my hands after all. He knows what I'm capable of. He's not stupid enough to do anything that'll endanger himself, him, so endanger them and save only himself. So where then? Only my footsteps echo along a dark passage, and I'm left alone gripping the handle of my pistol for some sort of comfort. Without proper lighting and with the storm still raging outside, the storm I've heard about this place seems to have some truth. To, oh, the story says seems to have some truth about it. Some. If I'm reaching a wish to entertain myself for a bit, I'll say there might also be ghosts whispering in my ears, calling. Of course, it's just the wind of the trees rustling outside. Nothing good will come of allowing these thoughts to linger when problems are piling up in front of me one after another, especially with what greets me once I get to the foyer. Though it's dark, the large windows illuminate the area, illuminate the area much more easily than any of the other rooms. And for where I stand atop of says I can even easily make up the forms recognize me even. It's already gone crazy when the intruders come into my house. I'm no stranger to a cop playing dirty. The smart ones knew that life, neither life nor criminals are going to play out. Play it. 
I was meant to say, but I'll be right back. Luke White woke up to a storm raging outside, and with his whole house eerily quiet, power still off as Butler was nowhere to be found. Even when called, taking his gun with him, he went to, out to investigate in the foyer of his own home. Da na 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 Recognise him as well, even. It's all gone crazy with these intruders coming to my house. I'm no stranger to a cop playing dirty, but smart ones knew that life, neither life nor criminals are going to play fair. And if one of these what sort is in the, on this, I'm not surprised too. But Lily, the estate agent, she doesn't seem the sort. And Daisy too. What will Kyle think of her Miss Pink if a poor tyke finds out about this? To double all off with the nerve. The nerve to look surprised when I announce my presence. Well, well, what do we have here? If I were any less sober, I'd say this is the beginning of a joke. Bloody trespassers. What is wrong with these people? Does he really think I'll be fine with them walking to my own home like this? What are they even doing here? If I didn't know any better, they might also be behind Hannah's disappearance. That's right, my love. They must have a motive. Make them pay. And it better be a good one. For all the wrong they've done to us, or a bullet to the head is the least all of them will deserve. Let's see. A photographer, a high school teacher, and a real estate agent walk into a mansion. Thunder crackles once again, cutting me off. This time it sounds hit. It sounds hit close enough that it nearly feels as if the windows and the ground itself are rumbling. All this definitely still a moment. I don't let it stop me, however, as I slowly make my way towards them. Taking one careful step at a time, relishing the expression of fear in their eyes. I suppose there's something ominous in the setting, with the heavy rain outside and the lack of light here. I kind of like it too, to be honest. Add something to the atmosphere. I suppose I must look like the villain now. But short of me getting closer to them, a noise to my left distracts me, briefly halting my movements while curiosity takes over every murse in my head. And it's a good thing, perhaps, that I did. But as soon as I look up, I see him. Another trespasser. Great. Just he's about to jump down the furniture that somehow ended up piled and blocking the door parlour. What happened there? And he did he really think it's a it's alright to do that in other people's houses? Lout. Teach him, my lord. Put him in this place. My hands are already moving before any rational ration, rationally can stop me. Fingers firm at my gun when I finally release the safety from it and take aim. Not him but his friends. They are his, aren't they? Why else would they be together? doesn't matter. He won't let the people he cares about to be harmed. My fingers on the trigger more than itching to shoot, but I hold back. Surely I could have simply taken aim at him, but more than seeing him bleed, I want to see the expression on his face once he realizes everything he's doing is futile. He's trapped. Lives are in my hands. His life's in my hand. Had I known there would be a party in my own home, t own home tonight, I would have opened a bloody bottle or two. <laughs> these people these days. In my own home, can you believe it? I feel so left out. I can tell the exact moment the realization dawns on him. A short second of his body freezing and blood draining from his face as soon as his feet hits the floor as he looks up. He's already a prey trapped by his own recklessness. How pathetic. And really, Daisy, even you, what would Kylie say? Luke, this isn't what you're thinking. You have to listen to us. There's something going on here. Well, obviously, why would I ask would people be trespassing in my own home? What about little Liddy over there, then? What's your excuse? Checking back? If your clients are doing okay, is that it? Is this what this is? We're doing good, by the way. Sir, please. Please what? Becca's right, sir. We need to get out of this place. You need to leave. <laughs> Not good enough excuse, darling. You people are the ones who need to get out of my sight. Don't worry, I might consider pressing light charges for all women. Can't say the same for the rest of you. But really now, I swear, the people of this city need to be taught the meaning of privacy. This is how you want to start the week. Why don't we just go with a bloody massacre? If we want to surprise people in their homes, huh? It's just a passing remark, of course. I'm not stupid enough to do something that'll bring negative attention to myself. Reputation and all that, I can't just risk it. Before having dead bodies here, ones that I'm not even responsible, they're the ones who trespass. It's, it's already quite too much. It'll literally be overkill, especially for someone like me. Nevertheless, joke or not, Feathers wastes no time drawing his own gun out of sight wave of my own. He even knows it's already too late. Still he glares at me. Still he fights back. Now, now, Feathers, manners. You're in no position to be pointing that gun at people. 
There's no desperation in him like I'm hoping. Just the noise flickering shortly before being un has been hidden underneath a challenge. The likes of him are the people I hate the most, even with their failures already glowing down at them, mocking every worthless move they make. They have the impotence to stare people in the eye. Why don't you put yours down first and then we talk about manners? Oh, he talks back for gall. You know, your kind pees me off so much, annoying most of the time, like a damn priest you can't be rid of. But to some degree it is commendable. I'll give people that. After all, we're almost the same in that regard. Almost, I'm still a better person, of course. He tells me to put the gun down, but I see no reason why I should. I'm a homeowner, in defense of my own home. I have a right to, I'd like to think. Questionable permit of firearms aside. It isn't like I wanted this, but I'm already high strung and their presence does not help. Bloody peasants. I can never seem to figure out how their minds fully work. Take this one, for example. Despite the pride brimming in him, how he matches my glare with his own. So he simply lowers his pistol after a long second nine surrender. The tense set in his shoulders tell me as much, but the closest he gets to lowering his own ego in favor of something I can't quite place. Interesting. Gotta admit, I'm almost disappointed, as you should be, my lord. I expected him to hold until one of us shoots the other. Can't say it'll be more exciting that way. A bullet inside any part of my body isn't something I'd like to have on a bad day like today, or any day for that matter. But it'll surely be predictable of him, and I like predictable. They're the kind of people who are the easiest to deal with, no matter the situation. With them, there's no second guessing what they'll do. He shoots, I shoots, one of us dies, the other walks away. Nothing complicated. Nothing requiring much brain power, just muscle memory who's the better shooter in the story. Yet here he is, dragging a deep breath in and setting aside the only thing protecting him. I can easily shoot him this way, be done with this whole farce of a conversation, instead of having myself listening. A conscious, a sorry, a concussion for a person who, in another life, would have always been the person I am today, had his, con had his circumstances allowed it. Damn shame, we might have gone along. Listen, right, I need you to, but alas, you broke into my house and somehow, somehow you expect me to listen like a good little boy. Are you a bit touched in the head, Ferris? I'm not the one breaking laws here. Look here, Blanker. If I wanted you dead, I could have done it so many times already. In fact, I could easily shoot you down, right here, right now, and you won't be able to do a damn thing even with that gun. A meeting of two prideful blokes will never go well, whichever lifetime it is, and I can only laugh at his audacity. His lack of shame and fear even facing the business end of my pistol. You know what I'm thinking right now? In a lifetime, we probably would have gone along well. The best truth I could offer him. Not many people, those who have slight slighted me, in particular, live this long to see it. And he should be grateful. You've already, you're already gracious enough, allowing him to stand in your presence like this. Yeah, especially when he has a lot to answer. Preferably right now, because as generous as I've been so far, my patience has its limits. My amusement can only laugh, last for so long. In two steps, I'm standing in front of him, grabbing him by the collar and the rest of the cold muscle of the ego against his temple. Ashton! Luke, no! Hey now, you two. I'm sure we can all talk about this. He'll end up with a pretty smirk on the wall this close. Teach this lout a lesson. What is it that you people really want from me? This is the second time this week I am getting weary of this little game. Did the NCA send you to apprehend me, or has something paid you off to kill me? Which one is it, Feathers? Mind you, my arm's getting tired, but I'll answer quick if you don't want to meet the business end of this gun. And he knows it. Of course, he does. Hitman or not, he has been trained, judging purely from his stance. But not many bother to be as cautious as him. One glimpse of my handgun's safety earlier is all it took for him to see I mean business. Similar, too similar. We're too alike in so many little ways, it's funny, down to the fact that he doesn't even flinch, no matter how heavy the threats in my words are. Even knowing how one flicker of my finger on a trigger would be enough to end his story, sorry, life. Oh, I didn't mean to skip past that bit. Instead, he throws more virtual, adds more kindling to a fire already burning. I already told you I'm not with the NCA. I'm just here to help. There's something else in this house and we're all in danger. You have to believe me, right? You need to let us go. You need to get out of here before it's too late. If you want to keep your sorry ass alive, you listen to people with more brain sense than you. Igniting it further that I can't help but return it to him with equal fervor. We don't need him, my love. 
why are you insolent? We both decide to move in that moment, both our bodies tensing, each of us racing to get ahead of the other. However, before we could get a head start, a voice unexpectedly rings above the chaos about to ensue. All at once, everything falls away into the background. All that matters is her. <laughs> Hannah? Oh, look, my d darling, my love. What do you think you're doing out here this late? The woman that stands out there is the one I married, the love of my life. So why is it that she gives me now? Uh, why is it, okay? So why is it that the look she gives me now makes me feel so revolted? Makes it so that there is a general sense of wrongness in the way she smiles at me. Hannah, thank goodness it's just you. You give me quite a fright. We've been looking all over you for you. Saying this makes my tongue feel heavy. I'm so used to lying, to putting on a face, but this just feels so wrong. It's such a small lie, yet a big one at that. To be afraid at the sight of my own wife for no apparent reason is illogical, yet her mere presence has been disturbing. For her suddenly devoted and near dependable nature, her obsession and possessiveness to her strange way of speaking, something has been wrong with Hannah as of late. I didn't want to admit it, but it was almost as if she turned into another person overnight, and looking at her now only seems to solidify this. It's almost as if I can't recognise my own wife. Fetch me! Whatever for, my prince. Look, that doesn't matter right now. You need to get out of this house right now, alright? Stay in the penthouse for a while. Leave our home? What if I wish to stay? It's not safe yet, darling. Now is not the time to explain. Just listen to me, okay, buttercup? I held out my hand to her in the hopes that she won't ask any more questions. I shove away the ill thoughts I have about her, about how this is not the wife I've married. People change and now is not the time to have some sort of extensional crisis about this. Our safety is priority by now, and I'll feel better about all of this as long as I can have her by my side. But she barely budges from her place atop the stairs, let alone take my hand. And the way she looks at me just sends chills down my spine. Why should I? Is something the matter? What about you? Are you not coming with? Was I what was I supposed to say? Where to even start? Maybe just confess there's some crazy lady woman around, and I like really like it if it were just uh, stayed here, stayed safe. Sorry. You just need to leave for a while so I can let security sweep the place, and and someone has to be there, yes, to supervise and all. That'd be my job, Buttercup. Still nothing. She doesn't move from where she stands, still with that amused grim on her face, as if this is all some funny joke and she's the only one who can see the punchline. But I do not wish to leave, and you should not either. You've just arrived, my prince. This is your home, our home. Would you really allow others to drive us away from it? But that is it may. It is dangerous here right now, and I'd rather have you safe rather than... I don't know, comfortable or whatever argument you wish to bring up. This is ridiculous, Hannah. We shouldn't be discussing this. You need to leave now. Let me handle things here, Buttercup. Uh, yes, of course, it would be so horrific. Over here. Over here. Although baffled and disturbed by Hannah's odd behaviour, Luke tried, the urge, tried to urge Hannah to leave. She flatly refused and when Luke angrily insisted, it was then that, well, when the whole house shifted before his eyes. Aha! Uh -huh. hmm. Okay, Hannah's body shudders and shakes as if she's about to have a seizure until her visage ripples and changes. Golden yellow hair is slowly stained by inky black and her face melts into that of a woman, the maid from before, with a menacing expression on her face, along with it is the shifting of the very ground we stand on. It's a slow thing, a whisper more than a bane as the darkness creeps into every corner of the room. The walls shudder and groan, blood running from the ceiling, crawls down the walls and stains the floor. It feels as if life is being sucked from the house slowly but surely. The beauty of this place is gone, with only the dead, decaying remains of a mansion left in its wake. I don't have to wonder if it's just the foyer that's become this nightmarish place. I can already hear it. Gone are the grueling of thunder and the lushings of rain, and wind against the foyer's high windows. All of that has been replaced by a more gritting sound. 
A cacophony of voices from nowhere and everywhere echoing throughout the now horrid walls. Voice that neither brings to us nor the people who live here. What's going on? Help, please! All throughout the house, shouts of alarm and surprise ring out, a mirror to the horror creeping up in each of us. Who wouldn't be shocked? If this is insane, even Daisy finds the woman that she is, trembles at the sight of it, clinging desperately to Lily, while Steady and Feather stand protectively in front of those two. Brave of them, I have to admit, to put themselves in front of a line like that, but it doesn't necessarily mean we don't feel the same fear as the rest of us. Something I don't blame them for. There seems to be no end in sight of this insanity. If anything, it only feels like it's the beginning of the end. Help me. Oh my god, please somebody, anybody. But who are you? So stay away. Let go, stay away from me. No, 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 stay away. Say, stay away. Mother of God, pray for our sis. Pray for our sinners. Their screams fill the mansion. She laughs all the while. A harsh, agonizing sound that goes on for what feels like forever. Until there's nothing but silence. Her horrid smile and pale hands reaching out to me. Calling. Beckoning. Pleading. I'm terrified I really am, like I should be. But I have never been one to truly stay afraid. I've long learned that fear will not get me anywhere. Cowering the corner doesn't help me safe and it will not keep me alive. Not like rage does. I've learned to use this burning hate inside of me to survive. There's no difference now. Stay away from me. Why? Why do you wish to leave? This is where you belong, my lord. Remember the blood we share. This is your home. Don't you remember? You promised to return. To stay. Together with me. With us. With people no different from you. Don't listen to her. She lies. I promise no such thing to anyone. We just bought this house weeks ago. How should I know what she's babbling about? I never even wanted to be here in the first place. A terrible case of mistaken identity. That must be it. I'm quite sure of it. I don't know this woman. This monster. Why would I stay next to someone like her in my entire lifetime? I've only made and kept sincere promises to a mere two people. Hannah Evans and Eleanor Chandler. No one else. The rest of those who claim I've promised anything to go back can go blank of themselves. Bloody hell, I may enjoy the company of women, but I'm not an idiot to start spouting such nonsense to anyone. A line must be drawn, especially if I am to keep myself alive. Yet she still goes on, insists, making me appear a lie in front of these people. Of course you still deny it. Have you truly forgotten? You haven't changed, I see. Still a deceiver. She's lying. You see, my love, nothing has changed. Still no difference, you and I. Just like the rest of us. Just like every single soul in this putrid wreck. We've waited for so long. You can hear them, yes? Their pleas, their calls, their invitation. Come, my lord. The house seeks its master. She, the monster, reaches out again. Her hands are gory, abhorrent sight. Along with that smile spread across her face, my body's already moving on instinct. Stumbling back, one step at a time in a desperate bid to be away from her, anything to put distance between me and this vile creature. No matter what she says, I am nothing like her. I need to get out of this house, out of this country preferably. There's no need for me here, not anymore, not to keep tied to this place. With Hannah beyond saving, no longer the same woman I know, and uh, Johan's lightly taken by this woman, nothing's left to bind me to this wretched city. I can leave, I can't. My footsteps on something, sending me sliding on my back, I'm flat on the floor. Besides me, a paper, familiar one, flutters down. It's this again, from the open house, though it feels less like a gimmick and more like a threat with what recent events. It must have fallen from one of the peasants in the commotion earlier. For a moment they appear conflicted to see in my hand, but why does they keep their opinions to themselves? Even the damn thing simply bear a grisly message to put everyone in the room to see. Help me. Help me. Help me. Is this it? What have they been telling us? Why everything has mon in my life has gone to shite because of some stupid old letter. An invitation indeed. One I am not willing to accept. Not any time. From the top of the stairs the creature moves again, drawing my attention back to her. Her gulch remains slow and awkward as she walks forward. 
and I smile, leave, never leaving her. But I don't. I won't give her the chance. I am not dying here. I certainly am not giving myself to a hideous creature like her either. Adrenaline kicks in and despite panic gaze with some worried glances from Daisy's friends, I pay them no mind as I reach the main door right. Well, warning that it slams open. We've really not the mansion grounds like I'm expecting. Before my minds can even comprehend what happens, black tendrils have already coiled tightly around my limbs, dragging every person in the foyer into the room. None of us even get to scream, when darkness completely envelops us upon the doors closing. I understand where your place is now, my love. You belong here. Is it so difficult to grasp? We've been waiting. There's a moment of panic when the fiend of the tendrils around my limbs finally dissipates. As soon as my eyes adjust to the darkness of the room and I'm on my feet, I'm reaching for my knife and hold it out, watching, waiting for every movement, using it as a way to put distance between me and those peasants. Who knows what they'll do now? We're all in desperation to get out of this house. There's only five of us in this room. Four of them, friends at that. I cannot trust these people not to turn on me. I cannot trust anyone. Not anymore. Not after this. Despite the pleading look, Liddy shoots my way, but they all huddle in the corner behind Steady and Feathers. But I have to remind myself that even people like her are capable of doing the unpleasant. She's only human after all. It's never an excuse why. Even Hannah has her cunning, manipulative movements. Though she does it much subtler than I. Why else would Liddy show this letter to us that day if not to save herself? I guess it backfired on her now and she and her friends are also stuck here. Still, I have every right to be livid. Everything, everything I've built has fallen apart. All because these people came into our lives. You. All of you. This is all your fault. If I'm dying to this bloody curse, I'm taking you all down with me. Hey now, Mr. Rye. I know the situation ain't good, but we have to calm down. We're all in the same boat here. You shut your mouth. If it weren't for you, for this letter, for all of you, none of this would have happened. Hannah would still be... Suddenly Daisy steps up and snaps the knife away from my hand. Don't you dare, Luke. Don't you dare put the blame on us. Without battering an eyelid, glaring at me as if she might just rip my head off in assistance. Said knife slides uselessly under the table out of my reach. I should have expected she's not the kind to submit even under threat. Right now, all of us appeared smaller, facing her anger. Last I checked, we're the ones trying to do the saving here. And what of your friend over there? Are you saying she isn't responsible for this mess, for the lies this sodding letter took? Dragging other people into her own problems, just so that she could try to save her sorry little self. You think I haven't seen that before? Getting tired of your double standards, Daisy. You know, this curse is an entirely different issue, Luke. Because knowing you, I don't doubt that even without this bat blasted letter, you would have eventually... Rebecca, stop. All of you stop this to hear Lily speak out loud. I can't say I'm not surprised. She has already given me the impression of someone so meek for the moment I've met her. Either from her experience or her station in life. She has never struck me as someone fitting to be a real estate agent. If anything... That meltdown she had during the open house had only proven my assumptions. Until now, quietly she puts herself between me and Daisy, cutting whatever scathing words we've yet to hurl at the other. The way she glares at me, it reminds me of a little of my own mom would look at me. Particularly when I've done something wrong, and it's not a stare she's used to showing. She has done this before, probably to a younger sibling. Huh? If she only sees us now as a pair of squabbling kids and not too mature adults, well, that's only to be expected. No doubt, that's how she sees us. For a long moment, there's only silence in the room. Steely, the big oaf, doesn't even dare break it. Neither does Feathers. With both merely watching us, uh, sorry, with both merely watching us, both of whims these men. Not that it matters when Lily starts speaking up again. Not after so many anger and tension is lifted from the room. Stop this, please. With or without that damned piece of paper, we a deep breath and exhale. And then she closes her eyes, a crease forming between her eyebrows while she grips her hand tightly in front of her. We would have still end up in this mess. The atmosphere of the defense in the room right after that. Admission is anything but pleasant. Can I count it that? Admission. Can I, sorry, can I call it that admission? It seems like it from the way her eyes nervously flicker between her friends and I. She appears to know more than she lets on, and how she makes herself appear smaller after dropping that bomb on us. 
doesn't sit quite well with me. And patience is something I don't have the luxury of having right now and bestowing upon other people. Why is this this girl now? Well, that's she not telling us? Because from the looks of this, even her friends have no idea what she's talking about. I'm willing to wait. I grab her arm before she retreats without explanation, wavering the letter still in my hand in front of her. Oh, sir, you're hoating me. Hey, hands off, right? Blank off, feathers. I have a question for your friend, and she better have the answers. Luke, will you stop taking it out on every single person? Your friend is hiding something, Daisy. She struggles for a moment, but my hold eventually forced her to look up at me. Fear and uncertainty spreads across her features, especially when her eyes land on the downed paper. As much as I want to be considerate right now, I want answers. What do you mean, Lily? I'm not sure about it. Don't give me that, you know something. Oh, please, sir, I just know the paper's useless, okay? There's people they mentioned in the news lately. All of those died. My co-workers, the open house clients. None of them have ever seen it, even Rose, and yet they all dead. I should have known, sir. That letter has been with me since I picked it up. And I swear I didn't make copies of this thing. Even if I wanted to save myself, I wouldn't do that to my friends or anyone. Is that what the trip to BRC for? Yes, I'm sorry. I couldn't tell you guys until I'm certain. None of you believed me the first time. I had to find proof. And yet we're all here. Are you taking me for a fool, Lily? We would have ended up here either way. Maybe. I really don't know. Sir, please. All I know is that paper isn't the reason why all of this is happening. There's something else about this place. Steve has been quiet this entire time, but the sound of him talking, however, whispered it is. Still manages to catch us all off guard. We all pause, turning to him with likely the same questions in our eyes. What? Oh, uh, I just thought, I mean, it's a stray thought, all right? Don't take my word for it. No, it might be something. What about this place, Sash? There's still a moment where he hesitates, but Lily's urge eventually spurs him into speaking. But I was just thinking, maybe Ash is right for why he went here. This is where Bella found the thing, right? And then this. It was just a hunch, Satch. We were not getting anywhere. But just because I went here doesn't mean we'll find the answers, all the answers we need here. Hell now, we're stuck here. Regardless, Steely pauses, allow, allows Lily to remember. Soon enough, whatever it is dawns on her, and her face lights up with something like hope. Of all things, in this nightmare, hope? Her head snaps up and she reaches to Lily's arm to give it a squeeze. Hmm. A reassurance or confirmation that me that mean sorry, the meaning is lost evil to Daisy who glances at them, baffled. Betty, what are you? Becky, it's this place. Think about it. What, you mean like burn this place down? What? No. We are not burning a multi million pound mansion, you peasants. I just spent a fortune on this. Bloody hell. Not only do I have trespassers in my property, they are also arsonists. How dare they suggest something like that? Bloody peasants. My head's already ate. Eight game just listen to them. To think this is all the solution they could come up with. I should have just stabbed all of them and made a run for it. This doesn't help with each second we're spending talk spent talking here. The crazier this whole place gets. Yes. Indeed the voices become louder as time progresses on. Let's see. Furious paranoid and trapped in the mansion with people he barely knew, Luke Wright threatened to take them down with him. Luckily, before the hysterical man could harm anyone. The voice had become louder and somehow sounding more vicious. If the things in this room start floating, mark my words, I will flip it. And they may not be thinking about it right now, but eventually, eventually they'll turn on me. Such is the nature of humours. Better find a way out of this place as soon as possible, if I want to stay alive. I still have so much to do. Our only choice doesn't sound sound, but who knows? We don't understand a shite about this place. Might as well try might as well try everything, yeah? Whatever works. If I also have to be one to make that bloody decision, so be it. Less room for errors. With the only sane one doing to thinking. On the off chance I'm wrong, well, they suggested it. I'm going to regret this, I will. Hmm. But with these cries growing louder, this has become the easiest decision I've ever made. I'm getting tired of hearing her sobbing, really. It's just irritating. Isn't she getting tired of it? Besides, someone has to act fast, think fast. And what else in this root cause of our problems but this place where the letter was found? No need to make things more complicated. It started here. Why won't it end here? If what Lydia said is true, then there's all the more reason to destroy it. 
put an end to this madness before someone thinks of putting this blasted play up in the place up in the market. When I get out of this, I swear I'm suing a bunch of people. Run that estate company to the ground if need to be. We spent millions, damn it. Millions! With a sign, perhaps a heavy heart, I opened one of my drawers in my study table. Taking a bottle of liqueur out of myself, then passing it onto every occupant in the room. They accept it, but not without a look of protest or a confused glance my way. It does shut them all up. So maybe I've done something good. Even more when I pop the cork off the bottle and pour its contents on the floor. Well, what are you simpletons waiting for? We waste no time dousing the whole room, the smell of alcohol filling the air. If it had only better, I'd say they're more than eager to set this whole place on fire. And the blaze catches, easily in this room. Hmm. When I set it alight, used a blasted paper as kindling. With the whole place drenched with wine and all manner of things alcoholic I've been hiding from Hannah, the small fire soon turns into a furnace. In a matter of seconds, we're out of the door. Hmm. It doesn't exactly lead to where I'm hoping it will, although end up in the kitchen does give us does give us more reason to play like a bunch of prior manics. Fishing the cure stocks among the cupboards, we also do the same thing we've done to the study. Door after door in every room we pass, pouring bottles after bottles of expensive aged to cure and setting everything on fire, only leaving once once the blaze has started in earnest. When we're out of the cure, we'll simply drop the bottle and take one off my knock scythe stashed one. And there's no lack of it here. The hard stuff, the shorts, the watered down kind. Gifts from a distant relative, friends, so called friends, you name it. I've made sure there's always one within reach. How many of these things do you keep in the house? I always have a few bottles in the bedroom, the parlour, and the dining room. You have problems, man. Well, this isn't the time to discuss them. Hannah had called me out on this numerous times before, telling me the same thing. I've always told her she doesn't have the half, know the half of it, before completely dismissing her concerns. Roy Watts, that woman, turns out to be useful now. Not to drown my sorrows, but for this, wonders of wonders. But I suppose I can now say it has also saved my life. But there's no time for some introspection now. Because with each room we pass and burn, the place also becomes easier to navigate, as if it's slowly rising itself, returning to what it's supposed to be. Soon we find us, we finally find ourselves standing out, standing before the main door. The strong odour of burning wood, cloth, and varnish alike wavers from under the doors of the rooms we've previously torched, slowly filling the hole with a thick black smoke. The blaze has also started in earnest in every part of the house. I can already feel the heat seeping from the rooms I've set aflame. In a matter of minutes, flames will engulf the whole house. Fittingly, this is where she appears again before us, watching us from the top of the stairs. While her, so where, while her word goes up in flames around her, however, what catches my eyes is expression on her face. Not the vast smile I've already grown accustomed to, of one where her eyes gleam with complete hatred. This one. Forlorn is the only word I can think to describe it. No, please, help me, help me, please. Can the dead still feel? Can she hear us? Or is that merely another one of her tricks to trap us in this nightmare? Like this, however, she seems almost like the woman she used to be. I have to remind myself she's no longer Hannah. The woman I loved is gone. And who stands before me is nothing but a pale imitation to who she used to be. And I don't waste any time pondering over it, not with the exit just a few steps away. The doors finally open and through it, I can glimpse the world outside, safety. However, I do turn it only to see the last of her, a farewell more than anything. For all her attempts to lure me, draw me in, her wishes to be with me, she does not stop me when I finally run from this horrid place. Quietly, she disappears. Ah, light it ablaze. Watching a multi-million house, house burn before me, for some reason, nothing about this bothers me. Maybe it's that one last look on her face that has changed it. Maybe it's what I've seen and heard inside. There's only a calm, a stillness. The same hush that comes after a terrible storm has swooped the countryside. And with it, is the sight of the sun rising above the horizon. Ever so slowly, the sky begins to lighten before my eyes. Darkness giving way to the warm morning hues, soft rays spilling over the vast expanse of Luxburn's countryside. 
Nearby the trees sway and rustle with the breeze. A passing draught that carries even into this room from outside, cold enough to make me shiver. The remains of a storm that has passed. In the distance I can hear the soft chirping of birds while the rest of the world stirs, wakes. Dawn at last. We are free. And that is how the tale works of that. Go across here and see what new events await us. Despite initial protests, Luke agreed with Isabel. He began dousing the place with alcohol and setting it on fire. Sure enough, as flames slowly engulfed the place, it returns to its original state, freeing them. Outside, at first light of dawn, the mansion burned to the ground before their eyes. It's over. Don't feel so easy about the over part, considering the fact that this is a interterrestrial thing that is happening where it's not entirely a physical being but a curse. Epilogue. Like the flames that engulfed the mansion that night, whispers quickly spread across Luxburn City after the incident. Officers who investigate it have simply deemed it an unfortunate accident, resulting in the deaths of innocent lives. Regardless of the truth, Luke Wright files criminal charges against Briar Realty Corporation after, for undisclosed reasons to the public, forcing the latter to declare bankruptcy, a move that has mere stocks with rumours further. But for those who still believe in the stories of the old, and those who know the truth, it is by a testament to the curse and the secrets of the Irma Grey Mansion has hidden for centuries. If there were come a time those would finally be revealed, only the ashes of the now ruined mansion know. However, on nights when the wind howls and thunder blooms across the sky, some still claiming hear voices, hearing of voices where it once stood, of cries and wails that fill the night and desperate calls for help for anyone who dares listen. As for those who once tread its halls, hmm. Although Luke Wright has won his legal battle with Briar Realty Corporation, another tech leaks place him and Wright Enterprise under the spotlight months later. This time, however, with the Chief Inspector Harvey Lee's sudden absence, the visitor isn't able to escape close scrutiny. In an investigation headed by LPD's Detective Inspector Ash Freston, all of Wright Enterprise legal business dealings with the past 10 years come to light. Excellent! Although his involvement with other crimes has still been investigated, the disclosure has caught a huge outcry, especially from the city's business sector. Sued on multiple grounds, the company is ultimately forced to shut down. Meanwhile, to avoid public outrage, once a fluent businessman immediately leaves the city, all of his bank accounts have been emptied, including his Luxburn's apartments, leaving not a single trace or clue where he might be hiding. The last anyone has seen of a man was on a flight bound for Ireland. Till this day, no one has heard from him. Even his people from the old right enterprise, who have all been left to deal with the aftermath. Though over the past few months, after the situation has calmed, some have cl made claims. So some have made claims of spotting him fi flitting in and out of the city, failing to check of those he has left behind. Hmm. With help of family and friends. Zachary Steele is soon able to open a photography studio of his own, something he has only dreamed of of happening as a child. Although he still hopes to get back to making indie films someday, client work and small projects has kept him mostly busy. Hectic as it may be, he can only be glad for the amount of work pouring in. It has made moving on from the incident in the Ermagrade Mansion easier, if not faster. But while there are still nightmares with the support of his family, his doctor, and his own drive, the dark images have finally turned into pleasant dreams. He is aware he won't tr ever truly forget, but he is no longer running away. At times, when he's not busy or after the, the hard day's work, he thinks there's another story for the big screen to be told of that. An idea he may soon turn into reality once his time affords it. In the moment that follow, Rebecca Giles becomes a prominent researcher within Luxburn's major academic cir circles. Especially after writing what she had discovered about Asylum Village and the Umagrain Mansion, 
With the help of Professor Andrew Clark, she is soon able to secure funding to continue her research, presenting her findings yearly at local and international symp symposiums. Now at the tail end of her current study, she hopes to publish her first book correcting all inaccuracies in the city's current history. A move supported by both colleagues, students and friends alike, though she still knows she still has a long way to go before she can even begin to change people's minds about it. Professor Clark has warned her as much as she preserves. Do it not for herself, but for the sake of a history for the future generation must not to forget. No matter how disturbing her experience with the curse may have been, she remains the worry what she has always been. Even after she is seen, she continues to fret over people she cares about, sometimes much to their frustration or embarrassment, but if there's one thing that has shifted, it's her relationship with the people in their little group, particularly Zachary Steely. In fact, on numerous occasions, she has been spotted dropping by his new museum, bringing the man food on days when he's swamped with work. They also seem to have grown more comfortable around each other than before. Maybe it's born out of their shared experience, or maybe the way they simply see each other. So, or maybe the way they see each other has simply changed naturally, due to the years they've known each other. Regardless of the whys, it's a change the man's welcome and appreciates. In turn, he stiffs to return her kind gestures when he can. For all the horrors they've seen, who would have thought that something good would come out of it? Excuse me. Things have inevitably become strained between Ashton Frey and Rebecca Giles in the months following the, the, her confession, and with their lives getting busier, the two of them eventually drifted apart. Although neither of them talks about it, and the teacher still strives to forget an old love, it's clear in Rebecca that there are still things, she, things left she couldn't let go of. If anything, however, this has made it obvious how much has changed between them, and how much she has clung to the idea for Ashton from their younger days, one that may not have been there in the first place. Merely an idea for the straight-eyed young girl, but if there will be a time she will ex able to accept this, to move on from the hurt and repair an old friendship that has fallen to ruin, only she knows. With her newfound courage, Isabel Santos finally chooses to pursue what she really wants for herself. Having made enough to keep her f family afloat for a few years and with their blessing, she quits her job at Brea Reality Corporation and takes the scholarship offer from the local university. Though remarkably out of practice and unsure if she will be able to keep up by the time she returns to university, she finds, us her, she finds her feet soon enough with the help of the people close to her. And with her confidence in her skills growing, so do the number of people recognizing her and her work. It doesn't take long for several award-giving bodies to take notice of her. For all her accomplishments, however, she has never truly forgotten what happened at the Irma Grey Mansion. The images still remain in her, and on particularly unpleasant nights, terrorists continue to visit her dreams. She knows that those will won't ever disappear from her life. It has become a part of her in the same way death has permanently taken from her. However, she's no longer afraid, and with a brave face, she carries on, earnestly wishing that someday she'll be able to print brighter, sorry, paint brighter, more vividly, thoughts on her canvas. An honest portrayal of life and hope amidst the fear. Shortly after accepting the scholarship grants from Luxburn University, Isabel moves from Sunnywell residence in favour of staying in a dorm closer, close to her campus. Although she makes the decision out of convenience, she won't deny also doing it out of a desire to avoid another awkward encounter with Rebecca Giles. Following the aftermath of a curse, relationships with girls turned like worm at best. While no harsh words have been exchanged yet, their wordless silences since the innocent has only pushed them them with them has only pushed for them further apart. Isabel leaves her home for five years with a heavy heart. And even though she has jokingly complained about Rebecca's boisy, bossy attitude in the past, she confesses meeting the woman's fussing. Despite their tense parting, she still carries hope they will one day be able to fix whatever has come between them. But if there will be a chance for it, it is a question they both ask until now. More than a year later, once everything in their respective lives has settled down, Statue Steady and Isabel Santos finally hold their first exhibit together. 
a project that has been in the making for almost two years. After the photographer casually brought it up to the other artists, while merely intended as a small event, it has been surprisingly attended by several members of Luxburg's upper class and art enthusiasts. Although only a few of the pieces has been meant for sale, the show has brought pr prominence to Zachary and Isabel's names in the city's art scene. It has, been since, sorry, it has since been followed by several other exhibits by the two, both in and out of the city. Currently they are beginning to hold their first show overseas. Let's just see where the relationship has ended off. Um, so Isabel is still strong. Uh, Rebecca down for both Isabel and Ashton. Up for Luke. Marianne, well, she's declined within the house. And that relationship is very strong. Default for Rebecca. Low for Ashton. Uh, yeah, down Rebecca. Up Ashton. Up Zachary. Default Luke. So it wouldn't be a surprise if... There was some good talk between Ash and Isabel in this epilogue. They were planning to hold their first show overseas. Yet in with this unexpected overwhelming flame, friendship between the two has remained strong. Theirs, after all, is a bond that goes beyond being mere partners in a small project. He's her family as much as she is his. Following his success in bringing the Luxburn firm case to a close, Ashton Frey received a recommendation for transfer to Luxburn's lead agency against organised crimes. An endorsement eagerly backed by the newly appointed successor to the late Chief Inspector Lee, Abigail Harris. Knowing he'll have more resources leeway and a bigger chance at ultimately bringing Luke Wright to justice, Ashton Frey accepts. He still warns the people close to him against Wright and his associates but only a friendly reminder now, more than anything. Though he does worry, he believes they are wise enough to know who what they are doing and trust their judgement. For now, he has decided to leave the evidence and the law to speak for itself and take care of a man once the proper time comes. Nowadays, people, sorry, police work and operations keep him busy, sometimes taking him away from the city he grew up in for, for days on end. A rare thing for him to enjoy once upon a time, yet this time he never loses his drive. Simply growing more determined after having finally found a clear purpose to close to the rush and excitement he dreamed of as a child. Although Ashen still keeps mum about specific details of his work, his experience with the curse has slowly taught him how to open up, especially to those who he knows that generally care for him. He still has a long way to go, he knows that, but for sake of people who are still with him, those who have chosen to stay, he hopes that there will come a day when he no longer has to hide his own lies, a day when he is no longer afraid of facing the truth in his own words. Hmm. Things have never been the same for Zachary Steely and Ashton Free. An argument ensues between the two shortly after they've been released from the Evergrade Mansion Hospital. Although the ways so, of all the ways are vague, and both have been tight-lipped about the matters after the fight has been broken off, with the rumour of evidence only for bits of conversation bystanders have heard, perhaps it's even an old grievance they have been holding against each other, only aggravated by whatever horrific things they've both gone up through inside the mansion. Whatever reasons, the two men have kept a considerable distance from each other since then. Ashton gives the man a wide berth when encountered in a public space. Zach simply avoids places with detective frequency. People who know them have simply assumed the spat will resolve itself in due time. But for the two of them, the way things have panned out in due time may never even come to pass. <laughs> Between the lingering trauma and their measly Attempts at normalcy. It takes a few months for the organists to finally live from both Ashton and Isabel Santos. After several weeks trying to find their voice and remembering how to act around each other, despite enduring affections, but once the only spades, there's only the usual banter and rap pots to fall back on. The casual talk and their friend and the friendly jibs. And for the both of them, it's easy like breathing. Like coming home after another journey, a comfort in spite of the things they have 
gone through, their days may still be filled with petty arguments and light teasing, but in the aftermath, when all has been said and done, something constant has already been forged between them. A quiet steadfast foe, so steadfast theme they can both hold on to as they both carry on. And that is the letter. I wonder what ending we'll get out of all of that. Surely there's like an official ending title towards whichever ending you get in the first place. And that was, without question or shadow of doubt, a fantastic experience. Thank you very much to all that has poured their efforts in days in and out. The endless days where there's probably been, been sleepless nights of making this game, making everything as they should be. And the horror scene in this game are particularly effective if you've never experienced this kind of horror before. For me, 99% of it has been a bit shadow because I've been used to this kind of horror from other games I've played in the past. But yeah, a very good game overall. Nothing bad to say about it as far as I can tell. And it is surely long enough that the amount of time spent on this game, the development of the workings has been all worthwhile. Now, apart from grammar mistakes, and I've heard in Discord chat that voice lines are missing, that this game really can't really be faulted in terms of its story deliverance. I really loved how the story was delivered in this game. There's so much to admire about the game in terms of how it was delivered, in terms of both its story and the horrors given to it. It certainly was surprising a few times for me when I couldn't speak. And hey, we all have times when we're thrown off by story. And there were parts in the story that did throw me off. But let's just listen to the voices that have been given to us for the credits. But I'm just very curious to see what the ending title is. Because surely each ending of this game has like a title for the ending itself. I doubt this is the true ending of the game. Uh, I doubt there, are tr there is a true ending of this game. Well, yeah, sorry. I... Most certainly there is a true ending to this game, but I doubt this one in particular was the true ending. Because I believe to make the true ending happen, you have to strengthen the friendships of everyone within the group of four between Ashton, Isabel, Rebecca and Zachary. Also possibly keeping Marianne alive. But I hope there's no like dead end routes there. I'll talk after this is done. programs so many people involved in this project not sure if I installed all those fonts so thanks everyone for playing hope you enjoyed the game it's been fun being part of a production I really appreciate the team's effort to incorporate what we suggested hope to see you somewhere again Eric Tsai no. all the different comments Ah, <laughs> uh, oh, that lovely emoji. Yang Yang Mobile, TO24 Duelist. Sound Cadient Studios, Slight Studios, and all that. Let's save for the moment. Uh, go over here, save. Where are you, Uncle?
please. She's here. She's still here, Uncle. Help me, please. <laughs> Uh, what the? I was like spreading that shattered fairy tale. Do you, if you're reading this, that means you finished playing the game in one way or another, and we thank you for your time you've spent in playing the letter. This game is our passion project more than anything. And we sincerely hope we've discovered and bring you a one-of-a-kind visual novel experience. You've done that without question or shadow of doubt. The letter is hopefully the first of many visual novels coming from us. If you like what we did with this game and would like to support us, please consider donating to our Patreon account. You can also follow us on social media to get the latest updates. Our usual handle is Yang Yang Mobile. Thank you so much for everything. Let's talk soon. Love. YYM team. Love heart. Is it just this? Phew. That ending was so surprising, poor thing. But. My hypothesis. Is that the curse doesn't originate from the mansion itself but the necklace that Hannah found in that second bedroom because that's also where Isabel found the letter and that original ghostly figure that chased after all of our characters I believe she is Charlotte Emigrate the last person to exhibit the household before Nobody lived there anymore, but also by the fact that she was the person that committed suicide and usually by the figures that you see when someone commits suicide from, let's say, a rope for example, it leaves that twisted crooked neck feeling that makes one feel so disturbed and distorted by, by that factor. But anyways, this has been a wonderful experience, no denial in that. But yeah, let's just look through the gallery and see what we've unlocked so far. So before we go into chapters with more things that will be locked, because obviously there are more choices involved. Let's just look through these one by one. All of these. I bet another image will pop up if we talked about her job rather than her cat, because that obviously led to a dark path, but Obviously, we didn't see much of Marianne after Chapter 5. Chapter 4 is where she died. Chapter 5 st started before she died in our run. I bet there is a way in which she will survive this and she is somehow with us within the mansion because the epilogue did not cover anything about her. So there is a few more things we can do within Isabel's chapter. But in the case of the grand scheme, Isabel's chapter is by far the smallest because it only covers the smallest amount of time within the timeline. Then we proceed on to chapter 2, where we're Hannah. We decreased our relationships with pretty much everyone, I believe. And it came to the point where Isabel eventually succumbs to the curse and the necklace she was wearing. Because I believe the necklace was the source of all of this. Epilogue. Okay, individual good. So, these are all the good things about individuals. Epilogue, 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 epilogue. It would be very nice to see, like, oh, romance endings. There's got to be some love affairs in this one. Individual bad. So, he's on the plane, fleeing to Ireland. Um, friendship good. So, we can see probably Zachary and Isabel's and... Ashton and Isabel's. Yep. Isabel and Ashton. Isabel, Ashton. Isabel. No. Sorry. Isabel, Zachary. Isabel, Zachary. Isabel, Ashton. Friendship bad. So we've got ourselves. Isabel, Rebecca. Zachary, Ashton. Hmm. Yeah. 
True ending. So this was okay. So there's more than one true ending to be held here. So we go on to chapter three from chapter two with Zachary and everything unfolds as it should. This was because we chose at chapter one for Hannah to decide for Zachary to contact his friend about this and give the mansion a blessing, which obviously leads to the priest himself becoming insane because of this wretched being, as it were. Hmm. And also the solution is to continue from there, going from different paranoid stages, temporary illusions, everything like that. So chapter four, it ends abruptly when I decided to click on the choice where Marianne stays within the wine cellar rather than coming out of it. Or for some odd reason, okay, that's when that is, and that's when it suddenly changes. But both of these are just the same. Look, gruesome image in it as it is. Then we go into chapter five with Rebecca, and throughout the course of the timeline, if we start an earlier date with the later characters, we're given less choices because they're already predetermined by previous choices, and hardly anything is unlocked in Ashton scenario there must be another set of operations here or well, not just another set of images altogether um, if Marianne was alive this would never have come about and then in chapter 7 obviously all of this came ablaze as it were but yeah good on our behalf as it were uh, that's just for uh, thumbnail purposes Deary me, that's like a horrific scene. Oh, thanks. I take a screenshot once you did that. That's not very promising. Thank you. Just got one of total darkness. She's crying. She's still there. Somehow she survived the midst of the flames. Uh, no. In the, no. No. Strengtheners or images for Hannah or Marianne. Only the seven characters that were cursed by the letter. So that's going to be it for now, folks. We're going to be proceeding back onto Chapter 1. And I'm hoping to find every single cranny within Chapter 1. Because that's going to be the earliest place where we can discover everything. But as time goes on, we need to deviate into more choices. And different choices as time goes along as in that but thank you very much for watching guys we're going to return back to the letter on chapter one where we're going to discover all the endings and hopefully all the little secrets we can find in that because that should be far easier than all the other chapters so thank you very much for watching folks and we're going to see each other on the next time of the letter have a good day and take care of yourselves <laughs>